everyone. Thanks for joining us for um, the Office of Higher Education's public engagement call. I think we had our last call in July, so it's been a while. So we decided to do kind of a fall update. Um, the office has gotten several new financial aid programs since a legislative session ended this year. And also we have Commissioner Olson on to uh, give a welcome and some statements. Um, after each of our presenters today, we have allotted a few minutes um, for questions for each of them, um, and we will be filtering those questions. If we do not get to your question, we will try to do some follow up, but please utilize the chat um, and ask questions uh, throughout. The Office of Higher Education seeks to engage with diverse communities to identify barriers in post secondary education, and the agency will work in collaboration with communities to provide equitable access to information and advice that leads to the pursuit of post-secondary education and or training for all Minnesotans. And that is also why we're hosting these public engagement calls. So I will not take up any more time. We have kind of a tight schedule here and I will pass it over to Commissioner Olson. You're on mute. I'm sure to, to join us today. Um, Thanks for, for taking the time. Um, like Nikki said, we have an incredibly packed agenda and we had shortened our calls uh, from an hour and a half to an hour. And so we're, uh, you know, ha we have a, an aggressive agenda, so I won't take too much time, but I did just wanna share with you a few of the things Nikki had mentioned, uh, you know, regarding some of the accomplishments we've had over the last couple of years. Uh, you know, many of you may be aware that, uh, you know, we, experienced a couple of abrupt closures of some uh, for-profit colleges and universities a couple of years ago and have been working um, tirelessly ever since to strengthen student and consumer protections uh, following the closure of those colleges, all in the name of you know, making sure students have uh, a more equitable experience um, and a predictable experience uh, in higher education in Minnesota. And so we're proud of some of that work. Um, many of you have followed along with some of the, the financial aid changes that we've made over the last couple of legislative sessions. Uh, we've continued to you know, make strong investments in the Minnesota State Grant Program, uh, including some strong policy changes. Uh, during the last legislative session, we had uh, some, some policy changes around the way developmental education credits are treated, um, exempting them from eligibility timelines. Uh, we continue to work on the, the state attainment goal ensuring that 70% uh, of Minnesota adults age 25 to 44 attain some sort of post-secondary credential beyond high school. Um, and of course, our research division at the Office of Higher Education continues to uh, focus on, on disaggregated data and making sure that we have a more true and accurate picture of who our students are in Minnesota, as well as highlight some of the gaps. We know, you know we have one of the highest attainment rates in the nation overall. Uh, for higher ed attainment, but we also have some of the largest gaps in the nation when it comes to our, our black students, our indigenous students, our students of color, our low income students. And that's where our focus at the Office of Higher Education lies. Uh, you know, we've continued to advocate to make strong investments in our public colleges and universities, both the Minnesota State Colleges and University System, as well as the University of Minnesota. Uh, continue to advocate for uh, specific financial aid changes uh, like the one last session uh, related to the Minnesota Indian Scholarship Program, making sure that there were additional eligibility opportunities for American Indian students in the state. Um, and, you know, couple that with uh, some positive changes around the child care grant and some of our new external partnerships like uh, like a partnership with uh, a student parent coordinator now at the Office of Higher Education focusing on um, additional additional assistance and resources to uh, students who may be parents who are who are in higher education. And you know finally I'll just wrap up by saying you know that I think it's all it's all pretty obvious to us here on the call, but you know we've seen some dramatic impacts on students as a result of the the COVID-19 pandemic over the last 18, 19 months. And um, you know, every student was impacted in some way, shape or form, but, you know, many of those impacts were felt differently by different students. Uh, and our work really has been and will continue to be, uh, especially now on creating a more uh, equitable higher education um, environment for every student 
regardless of, of you know, who they are, where they come from, where they live, uh, we want to make sure that, you know, we're providing the, the absolute best opportunities and, and pathways for, for everyone in Minnesota. And we certainly have that, uh, have that commitment, not only for, for myself, but for our entire team at the Office of Higher Education to continue that work uh, to create a more equitable higher education environment for everyone. So with that, uh, welcome to, to uh, this month's call. And we look forward to uh, engaging you throughout the rest of the morning today on a variety of topics, but also uh, into the future in future calls. And we're excited to, uh, to continue this series here uh, going forward. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Olson. Um, and we'll, we'll, with that last statement and those comments about COVID-19, we'll move right on to uh, our um, guest speaker, Cynthia Kenyon, uh, epidemiologist, supervisor on vaccines and preventable diseases at the Minnesota Department of Health to give us a little bit of a COVID update uh, as it relates to higher education. And um, I just wanna remind you all, feel free to put chat uh, questions that you have for Cynthia in the chat. And at the end of um, Cynthia's presentation or statements, we will try to get to as many questions as possible before going on to our next presenter. Cynthia. Great, thank you so much. And is there a way for me to share my um, PowerPoint? Ah, I see it. Okay, great. Can can folks see this okay? Awesome. All right, so um, yep, I'm Cynthia Kenyon. Um, I'm an epidemiologist here at the Minnesota Department of Health, and I've been working really closely with the Office of Higher Education over the last 18 months. Um, it's been a wonderful experience. Um, and so I'm here just to give a little bit of an update on all things higher ed and COVID-19. And I'm happy to take questions um, both right after I chat, but then also, um, you know, there is an email of folks who want to reach out and, and ask some additional questions too. Um, so I just want to give a little bit of a state of the pandemic in Minnesota. We're still seeing a lot of cases um, and activity. Masking and vaccine are some of our best tools to prevent spread. We've seen both of them be incredibly effective when it comes to reducing transmission. Um, in the classroom, in our community. Um, and so one thing that we've been really pushing with colleges and universities in Minnesota is, is to try to promote vaccine. Um, and, and overall we're doing well, but we have a lot of work to do yet. So, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. The other thing is considering masking requirements indoors. I know a lot of colleges and universities have implemented that. And this is in line both with MDH recommendations and CDC recommendations. Um, CDC right now, when you are a state or a county that has really high levels of transmission, they do encourage kind of more broad masking recommendations for, for indoors. And so I do know that uh, it's been great to see some of the colleges and universities step up to that and, and even have some requirements indoors. And really that is a great, great way to prevent transmission and, and keep our, our colleges open. And then really, even if a campus doesn't have a masking requirement, promoting a culture of masking on and off the campus is so important. Um, our students, faculty and staff go back and forth um, between the community and, and the campus. And depending on the campus, that, that might happen more more often or not. And so, and the other thing is that individuals might need to mask for different reasons. Um, <clears throat> if, a, if an individual can't get the vaccine, they're gonna wanna have that extra level of, of protection. Um, and, or, you know, some individuals are just more comfortable wearing wearing a mask and, and kind of preventing um, their, their risk of, of getting COVID. And so anything we can do to support that, not only supports the individual, but supports our, our community as well. Now, if you're curious where, where we kind of find some of this data in terms of what's going on in the county, if you're not familiar, so this is CDC's website and I've provided both links here and it was on the previous slide as well. Um, this, is, this is what the country looks like right now when it comes to transmission levels. So you can see that Minnesota, for the most part, is, is in the red, meaning that we have a really high level of, of COVID transmission in the state. Um, we are lower than where we were last fall, but we we definitely are experiencing a peak, uh, very similar to what we saw last spring and actually a little bit higher. I think we might be starting to come down from that, but it's a little too early to tell. So if you're looking for 
you're kind of curious about a kind of a snapshot like that, both of Minnesota and the surrounding states, this is a great site to go to. And you can also see a link to um, kind of guidance as, as to what CDC recommends based on these different transmission levels. You can also see where we are um, with some more local Minnesota data. Uh, this is a link, um, it'll take you right to a situation update for COVID-19 in, in Minnesota. We post our daily counts every day, except for on the weekend. So you can find a lot of information about our positivity rates, um, our total case counts, um, deaths, hospitalizations. And there's also some links at the bottom of this to weekly report for different sectors. If you're interested in what's going on in K-12, we actually have a staff for higher ed, um, but also nursing homes, um, hospitals, and just kind of weekly other other county level metrics that you might find interesting. So if you haven't explored this site and you're interested in uh, some of the statistics uh, and, and numbers around COVID, this will be a great place for you to, to look into. Um, the other thing I just wanna let folks know is that we are continuing partnerships. So with um, Office of Higher Education and our higher ed stakeholders, and some of you may have already been part of some of those um, partnerships. So when we work with the higher education stakeholders, that includes administrators, school health services, COVID-19 coordinators, um, and, and it doesn't really stop there. That partnership um, really started at the beginning of the pandemic. So in, in March of 2020, um, we all came together, uh, many different uh, volunteers from across the different colleges and universities in Minnesota came together to put together a uh, best practices and recommendations when it came to trying to figure out how we were going to open last fall, especially with a brand new uh, virus, but we were still learning so much about it. And that was just such a great partnership. It really helped inform practical um, guidance uh, that we've, we've continued that partnership and continue to lean on those various volunteers and work groups. Um, when we're facing new new situations or new recommendations or new approaches. So that's that's been great and we're continuing to do that. We also use these uh, stakeholder, we have weekly stakeholder meetings and we do use those to also try to inform and encourage um, uh, the best practices or most up-to-date um, kind of uh, advice when it comes to navigating COVID on campus. And so that's also been um, a great, a great way to to share information, share practices, um, tips and tricks, and whatever is the most new and current thing hot off the press from CDC. So, um, so as I mentioned, we have used those experiences, conversations, and feedback to help inform and update our guidance uh, with with when it comes to higher ed in Minnesota. And you can find a lot of that uh, on our website. We're also in the process of updating our website with more resources for students, staff, and faculty to include links to do what to do if you're a case or a close contact, mental health resources, and vaccine resources. Uh, so on that note, this is our website. If you haven't um, haven't uh, kind of explored it, please do, and we would love to hear feedback because we are in the process of updating a bit uh, as we shift from kind of this novel virus and more of a kind of a acute uh, pandemic response to moving more towards uh, an endemic response. So basically we know COVID is here to stay. So how do we navigate it within that context and also still protect our community? That does, that does mean that industries and institutions still need to have good protocols in place for navigating COVID on campus and trying to prevent it. But a lot of that is also gonna fall even more now to the individual to make sure that they're staying home when they're sick, getting vaccinated. Um, if they are positive for COVID, helping identify and notify their close contacts. So um, with that in mind, we've built started to build our website out a little bit more where there's a section of it uh, that's really geared towards the individual and another section of it that's geared more towards kind of that administrative planning. Uh, so we would love feedback if, if you um, haven't visited the site, both if you are, are new to it from the institution level, but also new to it from the individual level. You know, MDH does have a lot of resource for the general public. And so some of this will just be linking back to that. 
um, but we do want to try to make this um, interactive and, and helpful as we, we start to move in that direction. Um, but what you will find here again are kind of some information on, on what the, the best way to prevent uh, the individual can um, help in preventing spread on campus, but then also planning tools that we've continued to update uh, when it comes to uh, processes and protocols that campuses should have in place, uh, recommendations for if they start to see a real big increase on campus. Uh, some of you may have even experienced that last year. We got a lot of great feedback on, on that being helpful as to when to dial back or dial forward activities on campus based on how much how many cases they were seeing. Um, and then recommendations for responding to cases and outbreaks. Um, and some of this is in the process of being updated, but uh, still still great and relevant resources right now. Um, the other thing I just wanted to put a plug in for on this call is that MDH in general has also updated uh, some of their resources for cases and close contacts. So these are nice PDFs of what to do if you have COVID-19 um, for, for case. So you see that PDF. And then also uh, for the cases, tips to remember who your COVID-19 contacts are and what to do if you had close contact with a person. So if you yourself are a close contact and not a case. So just again, I encourage you to check out these links um, and do do reach out to um, to us if you if you have some feedback. So I talked a little bit about um, how important masking and vaccine were. So a note about vaccine wanted to just give a bit of an update on where we were uh, in Minnesota on that. So when you go to our main website on um, on NDH's website and they show the vaccine stats, it kind of lumps 18 to 49 year olds all together. But when we break that down, um, there is still quite a bit of work we, we need to do here in Minnesota when it comes to these age groups. So when we look at our 18 to 24 year olds with at least one dose, um, and what I did is I took the county level data and uh, calculated the means and median too, so you could see kind of what the spread is. The total for the state is 59%, but when we look at the mean or the median across the counties, it's a bit lower than that, meaning we still have quite a bit of work to do because we have some counties and pockets where um, we just, we aren't seeing the levels we want to. Um, and then same with 25 to 29 year olds, 30 to 34 year olds and 35 to 39 year olds. Now that 30 to 39 year old range is looking better, but what we wanna see is that all those ages getting up a little bit higher, um, especially when we think about um, that 18 to 24 year old or 25 to 29 year old and just how much they interact with our community and even interact in some of those more high risk um, uh, uh, venues such as concerts and and restaurants and bars and uh, what have you. I, I do remember what it was like to be that age. So, um, so the more we can vaccine, we can get into that community and help promote that, uh, the better. We are, no, there is, there is some vaccine hesitancy out there. There are concerns around the vaccine. There are a lot of questions around the vaccine. There's a lot of misinformation around the vaccine. And so one thing we have been trying to do is work with colleges and universities to create a safe space for individuals to ask questions about the vaccine, everything from concerns around fertility um, to uh, is it gonna alter my DNA is another question we get to will I get sick from the vaccine? Um, and and to we don't understand how the vaccine was produced so quickly, so we have concerns around that. So those are some questions and infographs we've really been trying to create a safe space for people to ask about, um, but also answer them and, and provide them with information on on uh, accurate information on some of those questions, which are are good questions. Um, the other thing that's going on now, this this impacts more kind of our individuals coming into colleges and universities. Uh, is that um, there is a big campaign right now for Minnesotans 12 to 17, year old, 17 years old who have completed their COVID-19 vaccine series at any point in 2021 can enter for a chance to win a 100,000 Minnesota College Scholarship. So um, for those of you who um, are recruiting students or, or even working in the high school, this might um, be a great way to, to encourage that vaccine. The other thing, and I'll provide the links uh, to folks after this, is there we did work with the colleges and universities and our vaccine outreach folks here at MDH to put together a student vaccine ambassadors uh, campaign. So this is great. We actually got a representatives, uh, student representatives from across the different systems 
to put together some, some vaccine um, messaging and talk a little bit about why they got vaccine vaccinated, including some students who were initially hesitant about getting vaccinated. So it's great. And we'll make sure we, we share those and feel free to use them as you would like. And then just some other vaccine resources um, that, that we have and, and can share. So. Thank you. We can take some questions if we have time. Thanks, Cynthia. Um, I'm not seeing anything in the chat, but you all still feel free, even if you don't come up with the question now, if you come up with the question later to put it in the chat and we'll try to do some follow up. Um, I did put the link to the fact sheet about the um, kids deserve a shot initiative um, for you all to have immediately. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention, I know that um, Cynthia and our team uh, spoke to our student advisory council yesterday about um, vaccines in higher education. And one of the things that was mentioned, and I'm sorry, Cynthia, if you did kind of allude to this, uh, a good way to help that age group um, was kind of peer to peer um, in that direct contact. And I know it's kind of hard uh, because a lot of times we're virtual, but um, that is uh, seen as a good way to encourage folks to get vaccinated and get um, other information besides the, the department providing additional information. It's more word of mouth in those group settings um, from their peers. Um, so with that, uh, there's no questions that I see in the chat. So we'll move on to our next presenter, Kat Kalima, who is uh, our, oh, wait. I think there there are some coming in. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I think it's. Um, is there an opportunity to uh, access some of the new federal funding to support this initiative um, around? Oh, this is not related to uh, um, directly related to this. So we'll we'll get to that question later. I think this is more towards the commissioner. Um, so I'll move to Kat Kalima, our outreach and communicate, communicate, communication coordinator um, to speak on Minnesota Ghost College and College Knowledge Month, uh, which is October. I know we're at the tail end of October, but uh, Kat has some great information regarding the, the initiative. So Kat. Thank you, Nikki, and thank you, Cynthia, for all of that wonderful information about the vaccine. Uh, and vaccine and uh, coronavirus prevention. So thank you everybody for <clears throat> for being here. I'm so excited that, that you're here and I'm able to tell you a little bit about Minnesota Goes to College. So I also have a few slides to show you, but basically if you don't know what Minnesota Goes to College is, it's our state's college um, going campaign. And uh, we've had several names uh, over, the, over the years. It was originally college uh, application week, and then it became College Knowledge Month. So I think I think that that uh, resonates usually with a lot of people. There was also uh, College Goal Sunday, which either happened right before or after the Super Bowl to get people who are already all together to apply for the free application for federal student aid or the FAFSA. And anyway, all of those things uh, were very separate, and so we decided to put all of them under one umbrella and brand it as Minnesota Goes to College. So that's a little bit about the history of, of this initiative, and I'm going to share my screen really quick to, to keep me on track. So, um, so yeah, so this is, this is Minnesota Goes to College. This is our steering committee. Uh, my my partner in crime and uh, co-chair Beth Barsness is not able to be here today, but she is at the Minnesota Department of Education. She's on the left, I'm on the right, uh, and this is our steering committee. We've got a variety of different representatives from Min State, the private colleges, uh, MACAC, MINAC, so that's the Minnesota Association of uh, Counselors of Color and Minnesota Association of College Counseling. Uh, Counselors, I'm sorry. There's there's a the alphabet soup, but but you know um, you know what I mean. Okay, thank you, Cynthia. Um, but it's it's made up of a bunch and and MAFA as well. It's made up of a bunch of uh, different higher education and K twelve and nonprofit partners. So that's who Minnesota goes to college is. Uh, it's made up of like I was saying that three initiatives. So formerly it was, you know, Minnesota, just Minnesota goes to college. It's now uh, the FAFSA and the DREAM Act events. And most recently we added something called uh, Decision Day Celebrations. So this is a national initiative um, out of the office of Michelle Obama when uh, uh, Barack Obama was president. 
Uh, and essentially what it is, it's celebrating a student's decision after high school. So whether they're going on to their career or um, into a two-year, four-year, uh, or into the military, any of those are considered, uh, you know, education after high school. Uh, and so that's, or just a, a decision after high school. So that's, that's what we're celebrating uh, during May. Uh, and so a little bit more about Minnesota Goes to College. So you can register your site. Typically, we do have a lot of high schools. That's the majority of the folks that we see registering, but also parts of uh, college access organizations as well. And what we provide uh, in, uh, in support uh, is a, a monthly newsletter, access to post-secondary community, a lot of resources, both in English and in Spanish. Uh, and some training videos and virtual events, which you will see in just a minute, uh, some more. I'm gonna go to the next slide. Uh, and so we do have, like I was saying, these bi-monthly events where you can learn a little bit more about a variety of different things. Like I know last year during the height of the pandemic, we had uh, topics like how to, how to visit college campuses when you can't actually visit. Um, and most recently this year we've had uh, a FAFSA update, which unfortunately there were some technical issues. So if you are on this call, I'm glad you were able to, to make it on uh, and weren't able to get on to that one. I, I sincerely apologize and we have rescheduled it and I will put those links in the, in the chat so that you can register for them and we're using Zoom. Uh, so if you're familiar with Zoom and more comfortable with Zoom, um, there will be no technical issues with, with that one. Uh, but that, that also being said, we do have a DREAM Act training, and that's for everyone. It's open to the public. It's, it's hosted and uh, instructed by Megan Flores, who you, saw, who you will see uh, and hear from a little bit later uh, this morning. So, um, yep, okay. So, so that is a little bit more about Minnesota Goes to College. And the last thing that I really wanted to show you um, is is or rather to just tell you about is that we do have um, during the month of October, like Nikki was saying, we have uh, free applications. So it's not just the office. Obviously, it's not the Office of Higher Education. We're not an institution, but Minnesota State, um, the private colleges, the, uh, the University of Minnesota, I think, uh, provides either days or weeks or at, in some institutions is free always. So I can put that link in the chat and you can check it out to see which institutions are offering or waiving fees and when. So that is a little bit more about Minnesota Goes to College. If anyone has questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer. And I will put the links for the Minnesota Dream Act training with Megan Flores, which is on November 2nd. Uh, the makeup, like general FAFSA, the free application for federal student aid training, as well as a few other links uh, for those of you who are interested in learning more about free applications. Thank you, Kat. Um, if there's any question, put, put them in the chat. Um, to keep us moving, I'm going to move to our two financial aid directors, Megan Flores and Megan Fitzgibbon, to provide. Um, Megan Flores is going to also kind of lead us into a DREAM Act application um, and then into more of updates on new financial aid programs. Um, and and uh, I, if we have time, I'll try to get to some of those other questions that I just received uh, regarding a different topic. But uh, Megan Flores, go ahead. Thanks, Nikki. I'm going to go ahead and get some visuals here pulled up. Can you go ahead and let me know that you can see? We can see. Wonderful. Thank you. Hi, as Nikki mentioned, my name is Megan Flores. Thanks for being on the call today. I am one of our state financial aid program managers. Myself, along with my colleague, uh, Megan Fitzgibbon, we will be sharing some information about our financial aid programs and the changes to them, as well as some new programs that we have this year that we're rolling out. Um, and there's our contact information. So today we're gonna talk a little bit about the Minnesota DREAM Act, uh, so the state grant program, uh, the post-secondary child care grant program, the fostering independence grant program, which is new, uh, some changes to student teacher grants, as well as the new Future Together grant. Uh, the Minnesota DREAM Act has been impacted by a couple of changes that have happened at the federal level. 
hopefully many of you have started to hear some of the information uh, that happened either via FAFSA simplification or the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021. Uh, one of the pieces in that uh, Consolidated Appropriations Act was removing the requirement at the federal level for selective service as well as um, drug conviction eligibility to no longer be uh, come into play at all for federal financial aid eligibility. Uh, the Department of Ed has decided to early implement that for the 21-22 school year, and so that's this current academic year. Uh, those questions do still appear on the FAFSA and will, unfortunately, for the next couple of cycles, because it will take a full three years to phase those questions off. However, they do not affect student aid eligibility. Uh, from our perspective and the state kind of view is that the selective service registration was actually never a requirement for our Minnesota state grant program, which is our primary need based program. Uh, however, there is kind of a subtle impact to the Minnesota state grant for folks who use the Minnesota Dream Act application to apply. In our state, we actually have 10 different ways a student can be considered a resident or 10 different definitions in law uh, that help get a student access to our state financial aid programs. One of those definitions is the Minnesota Dream Act way of establishing residency, and that is the only way that actually in the statutory language includes any mention of selective service. And that mention, as you can see here on the screen, um, as well as high school attendance in the state for three years, and then either graduating from Minnesota high school or earning a GED in Minnesota. The selective service piece is the federal selective service requirement. So not the US Department of Education, but the country as a whole. And so we did have um, some legal interpretation on that. It is tied to that federal selective service. Uh, so what that means is that if the only way a student can establish residency is the Minnesota Dream Act way of establishing residency, then they do need to register for selective service. Uh, that selective service requirement applies to the gender assigned uh, of male at birth and for folks who are ages 18 to 25. However, if there are students... <laughs> Sorry, um, your your slides aren't moving on our end, so we only see the imp the welcome slide currently. Thank you. I have three screens up here. So there they are. Uh, we'll Thank see. you. <laughs> yes, okay. we can see them. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for letting me know, Nikki. Um, so as I was mentioning, if if the Minnesota Dream Act way is the only way a student can establish residency, then they will need to register for selective service. However, there are many other ways that students who use the Dream Act could establish residency. So for example, if a student is legally residing or lawfully present in Minnesota at the time they graduate from a Minnesota high school, that is the way they uh, establish residency. So this uh, predominantly comes into play for students who have been granted deferred action for childhood arrivals or DACA. And so if a student has a DACA granted at the time they graduate from a Minnesota high school, they are a resident of our state and they do not need to do selective service registration. That same um, condition would apply if the student is you know, legally present or lawfully residing in Minnesota for purposes other than higher ed uh, for 12 months and they establish residency because they're not a college student, they're just living here um, documented then they establish residency that way and they don't need to apply for selective service. And then finally, the third kind of more common way would be that if a student lives here in Minnesota under DACA or some other legal uh, presence or legally residing or lawfully present status for uh, a minimum of one year and then they earn their GED in Minnesota, that student also wouldn't. And so in order to encompass these Nuances, we're updating our website, our communication to our Minnesota Dream Act application, as well as the database that we internally use to process applications so that we can help screen out that requirement for as many students as possible and not require that selective service. Another change that we have seen is for our state grant program. Dennis mentioned this in his opening remarks. Uh, we are now able to exempt developmental and below college level courses from counting against the eight semester equivalent of post-secondary attendance. So our state grant program, a student can get that for up to the equivalent of eight semesters of attendance. However, this change allows us to not count against a student any developmental education that they're taking while they're in college. 
And so this is effective beginning with this uh, financial aid cycle 2122 and moving forward. The student can still count those remedial courses in their enrollment level when the college is awarding the state grant program. As long as that student is accepted into a program, a degree program, a diploma certificate program, and then they're taking that um, developmental work or remedial coursework as part of that program. The school can um, continue to um, Oh, I'm sorry, I was going to mention the part about uh, the non credit piece. If it's part of a student taking that for a program that leads to a high school diploma or GED, that is not something where it can be counted. And there's no limit on that. So the aid administrator can count that for multiple terms if that's what's required for the student. And then even if that coursework qualifies to be in the enrollment level, so they're earning state grant or they're being paid out state grant, they still don't have to include it when they're adding up that coursework to me measure or monitor that eight full-time semester equivalent. And again, this is all effective July 1st and moving forward. Um, the other change that we've had for the state grant program is that we were able to change the language for when a student withdraws to uh, essentially help the student earn back that semester and have it not count against the limit on the time they're enrolled in school. We changed the wording from major illness to a serious health condition, and this more closely aligns with the FMLA definition. It also expands it to students who withdraw in order to care for a spouse, a child, a parent, or someone else in that household who has a serious health condition. Our child care grant program, the post-secondary child care grant program, also experienced some changes this past legislative cycle. Uh, these are fairly large overhauls to this program. We were able to remove the eligibility cap regarding enrollment. And so we are no longer monitoring terms of post-secondary attendance for the child care grant program. We're monitoring the actual terms that the student received the grant. So that is what is used to measure how long a student can receive the grant program. And it is over 10 semesters rather than eight. We also removed the minimum enrollment requirement for undergraduate students that had been at six. You had to be at at least a six credit level in order to get any kind of child care grant. You can now get a child care grant if you're eligible for as low as a one credit enrollment. And obviously the amount of the grant does increase the more credits you're taking. And then under the previous uh, award cycle, we were required to cap the maximum grant the first year of the biennium at 3,000. We are now moving that to 6,500, and this is effective, all of these changes with the current 21-22 academic year. And we're now tying that award amount to the applicant's expected family contribution under the federal needs analysis. Uh, we've also provided some greater detail on those award amounts and basing it um, on the undergraduate and graduate credit levels for which the student is enrolled. And so we've created a chart that's a little bit easier for students to understand, you know, if I'm undergraduate or graduate, what enrollment level am I at? And then what would my award be? So that the student kind of knows ahead of time a little bit more about what their eligibility would be, and then might feel a little bit more invested in filling out the child care grant application. And then finally, for the child care grant program, we were able to put into play that same definition change for the state grant. So no longer um, taking away that unit count or that uh, term of receipt of the grant as counting against the student if they were forced to fully withdraw. Um, a new program that we have that we're working on implementing for the 22-23 academic year. Uh, so right now this year, we're kind of in the planning stages is the fostering independence grant program. This program has a $3.7 million per year appropriation. It is a last dollar program that provides grants for students who are currently or were formerly in foster care, and they could receive this grant, the fosters grant for up to five years of higher education. Uh, it does require a FAFSA to be filed and there will be a separate uh, foster grant application. Uh, it is a last dollar program, and so it does take into account uh, the student's expected family contribution and any other forms uh, of financial aid that the student is receiving. There's a little bit of a difference in what's looked at if the student's attending a public versus a private institution. Uh, but the intent of the program really is that if we have students who 
uh, are currently in or were formerly in foster care that they could receive grant aid to cover their full cost at a school here in Minnesota. Um, there's a, again, as I mentioned, a little bit of a nuance regarding how the awarding happens, depending on the type of institution the student attends. And so we do have some base level language about that from the statutory language, and we'll continue to create better tools to help students as well as state aid administrators understand that as we roll out the program. Um, right now, we're in the beginning stages of that planning, hiring a program administrator, um, creating an opt out process for private institutions that might choose not to participate, collaborating with the Department of Human Services some, since some of the financial aid or aid programs that are taken into consideration are awarded outside of higher ed, and then really looking to get everything ready and go with communications and marketing. I will say that for the fosters program, I am starting to collect names. So if you have foster youth you're working with, um, and I've already started to partner with some community nonprofits and social workers in Douglas County, Hennepin County, some other counties across the state to just give me a list of names of students that are asking, and we'll keep that contact list at OHG. And then once we have things up and running, make sure to reach out to those students. And then I will go ahead and pass it over to uh, Megan Fitzgibbon, my colleague. Not sure, Kat, if you wanted to hold off on questions till the end of the financial aid piece or take some right now. Or Nikki, excuse me. I we're gonna wait till we were done. Yeah, we can okay, we can everyone. get through all the financial aid uh, presentations and to take questions. All right, go ahead, Megan. Hi, everyone. This is Megan Fitzgibbon. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, student teacher grants. Um, so, oh, you know, stop sharing, Megan. Yep, I just moved my mouse and it did not like that. Um, I actually the sharing function I no longer have. So, Mercy, oh, you can switched it to me. Oh, switch somebody switch it back to Megan Flores because I don't have the slides up. Okay, now I'm seeing it. Thank you. All right, thanks. Um, so, uh, the student teacher grants, um, this is actually a, a, a continuation of a current program. Um, our agency has um, administered a program called teacher candidate grant for the last uh, three, four years. Uh, and um, this new program, our new programs are kind of a continuation of that. Um, um, intent of uh, providing funds to students who are in teacher preparation programs um, when they're doing their one term of student teaching. Um, so we now have um, one application, but funds and awards are made to students out of two different pots of funds. Um, so we have one grant that's the underrepre uh, underrepresented student teacher grant, um, and that right now is set an appropriation of 1 million per year. Um, students, and this is for students who belong um, to racial or ethnic groups underrepresented in the Minnesota teacher workforce. We have another um, uh, set of funds that are for student teachers in shortage areas. And these funds are available to students who intend to teach in an identified license field shortage area. And the list of the shortage areas is on our website, the ones for this year. Um, or and or they intend to teach in an identified rural school district, and that's also on our on our website this year. Um, both of these programs, and um, in general, previously the teacher candidate grant um, do have usually have more demand than funding that is available. Um, so it's important for students um, that are in teacher prep programs to kind of be aware of when they're um, going to plan to do their student teaching. Um, there are various different ways that people are doing student teaching in their um, teacher prep programs across the state. Uh, so uh, some might be doing eligible student teaching experiences in one term or every term. Um, and so they could apply for this grant um, in more than one term. Other more traditional teacher prep programs might only be doing one one term of actual student teaching, uh, maybe in their last semester or something like that. So it's important for teacher or students that are in teacher prep programs to um, reach out, um, talk to their financial aid office at the college they're attending, um, and find out more about this program. And you can move to the next slide. 
Um, I'm really excited um, to, uh, un, you know, to discuss and, and bring up on this call of the future together grant. Um, this is a new grant that we have um, just announced in the last few weeks. Uh, the fund, the grant will be uh, funded through a temporary program through 35 million dollars from the federal um, ARP funds. Um, and we'll begin um, awards starting in, in this next spring semester. So the spring 2022 semester uh, students who first enrolled either in this current fall semester or later will be eligible for awards beginning in spring. This includes students who have newly enrolled, so never been enrolled in college before, but also returning students who um, as long as they have not been enrolled in the um, three previous terms. Um, eligible students will receive grants um, from up to from 100 to 15,400 a year. Um, they will all go, go towards the cost of tuition and fees at Minnesota public and tribal colleges. Uh, the award amounts will be determined um, after all grant and scholarship aid is applied to tuition and fees. So um, that's why some students may get a small grant, some may get a larger grant. It kind of depends on um, what they're getting, what other aid they may be receiving. Um, and you can move to the next slide. Um, and um, there are um, specific eligibility requirements for this. So we have kind of general eligibility requirements for most OHE programs, things like they have to be meeting satisfactory academic progress. They have to be a Minnesota resident, which um, uh, Megan Flores talked about earlier um, in regards to the DREAM Act. Um, so all of these students will have to uh, meet those requirements. But in addition, uh, they do have to meet uh, two very specific or one of two very specific uh, requirements. The student has to have a family AGI of less than 100,000 um, and have worked in a critical industry at least part time in essentially the last year and a half or so um, since uh, the beginning of COVID-19 pandemic until December, this December. Um, and the list of critical industries, uh, you know, most are, you know, kind of the what you would think of, um, but we will have that available on our website and for colleges to um, to reference to when they're determining who's eligible. Or they have to have received unemployment benefits during that same time period. So this is the piece of the program that's intended to um, to serve students and families who were impacted by the. Um, COVID-19 pandemic specifically as it relates to where they worked or where they, um, you know, that they received unemployment benefits because they couldn't work during um, during that time period. Um, another way students can qualify is if they, um, which mysteriously dropped off of my slide, so I'll have to add that back in before we send out the updated one, is that any student who is um, who has a family AGI of less than 50,000 will qualify without having to have those work related um, eligibility. Students do have to be enrolled at one of the public institutions and tribal colleges in Minnesota and be enrolled in a qualifying academic program that leads towards employment in a high need occupation. We'll have more information on the programs coming out soon um, at each campus. Uh, we're just working with all the college campuses to make sure we identify them correctly using the, the terms that they use on campus and we have the correct links all set up if we when we set up our website. And I think that's all I have. Um, there's um, our uh, Megan Flores and I, we have our contact information at the, at the top of the slides, um, but we, you know, we do have um, our general contact information. And feel free, most many of this stuff has been updated on our website too. So if there's other questions um, that we aren't able to catch here or you think about something later, feel free to 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 check out there too. Thank you, Megan and Megan. Um, so our next presenter is Nicole um, Whelan. She's a research analyst. And because I want to make sure we answer some questions, Nicole has offered to just share the link to our FAFSA completion goal. Uh, dashboard, which kind of explains. So the state uh, mandated that the office shall develop FAFSA completion goals. Um, and Meg, uh, Nicole and uh, a team of staff at OHI and MBE have been working on strategies around that. And Nicole and the research department has developed a dashboard to track that um, those completions. So Nicole, feel free to share the link in the, in the um, chat, but I'm gonna um, try to answer some questions or ask some questions that were put in the chat. Um, one was around if we can share wisdom 
on remedial preparation for immigrant students <laughs> for two year and four year colleges um, as they need help strengthening um, math, writing, comprehension, and, and all of that stuff. So that I don't think that's a direct question for any of the members on our current panel, but it is something that OHI is constantly looking at if we think about the attainment goal. Um, and we've been working with um, our K-12 partners, um, even our workforce partners on better strategies uh, to uh, assist these populations. So uh, we can uh, have a future topic regarding that um, in the future. There was another uh, question around the attainment goal um, data and assessment and how we um, track uh, students with disabilities. So our research department, um, so that information that we uh, put in our um, annual report for the attainment goal in education for Minnesota um, focuses highly on race and ethnicity as that was part of the legislation. Um, but we know that there's intersectionality. So our research department is looking into incorporating disabilities. Um, we do have to, there are some data sharing snags that we're looking into because not all institutions share that data with OHI. Um, but it is something that our research department is working on and understands that that is a request and a need uh, to focus on some of those intersectionalities. There is information we do get that we've been getting prior to the attainment goal, like gender um, and things of that nature that could be incorporated or uh, aligned with some of the attainment work. So we're working through that as well. The other question that we had in the chat that is a question that people on the uh, panel could answer is when will OHI restart their year yearly financial aid workshops um, that were held um, in this, uh, this is primarily a question, I guess, coming from high school counselors who uh, feel like they don't have like the the knowledge base around financial aid and that those work workshops are very helpful. And I think this might be uh, a question for Kat because uh, uh, this is kind of the area that she works in uh, with Beth at MDE. So Kat. Yeah, thanks, Nikki. So to who, whomever was, was asking that question, yeah, we, when we lost, uh, why can't I think of her name right now, Nikki? Uh, Jenny Dodds, excuse me. So if she's on the call, I'm so sorry. Um, but when we, when we, when Jenny Dodds retired, we did have a huge gap in our agency for counselors who used to come from all over the state to come do the financial aid training. And so to your to your point, Nikki, yeah, it is something that we've been trying to fill with the counselor calls and with the FAFSA virtual training, but it, I, I do continue to hear from counselors saying that it isn't enough. So this 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 comment wasn't uh, surprising to me. And if if it's possible, I'd, I'd love to get that person's contact information so I can follow up with you and hear a little bit more about what specifically you would like to see. Uh, we do offer, uh, like, like I said previously, the FAFSA general training, and it is an hour and a half uh, taught or instructed by uh, Jeff Olson from Bethel, and then we do have Megan Flores going over the, the Minnesota Dream Act, but I hear you and understand that as a high school counselor, you have so much on your plate that financial aid is just like another aspect of it that it sounds like you need more training. So um, let's connect. If you could put your uh, email in the chat, I would love to to follow up with you. Thanks. Thanks, Pat. So I'm not seeing any additional questions. Like I said, if you do have them, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, I think we have a few minutes. So if Nicole wanted to speak briefly about the FAFSA completion goal in the dashboard, I'm gonna give you that opportunity before we close out. Um, oh, and oh, nope, a question just came in. Hold on, Nicole. Um, what is a future together grant recipient change? Uh, what if they change their major? Um, and Megan Fitzgibbon, you can answer this, but my assumption is, they the their specific majors that will be eligible and if they switch then they're it's an annual thing so they'll be looked at annually um for whether or not they are eligible so if they switch their major and it doesn't fit in with fit into one of the el eligible majors then they will mo no longer be able to receive the grant and megan you can correct me if i'm wrong yeah that's fine it, uh, you're you're I think you're there. Um, we'll have all of this in a guidance document that we'll provide for colleges um, that will be doing all the eligibility determination. But in general, if they transfer from one eligible academic program to another eligible academic program, it will be fine. They will likely be, you know, qualify for the award. 
Um, the funds are limited and are limited, uh, you know, we will have a limited number of um, terms that can receive funds. Um, but if, you know, they can be in a bachelor's degree or a certificate, um, so that that's not limiting. But if they do um, switch uh, majors to an ineligible program, um, then they will lose eligibility in the term when that becomes effective. Um, so, uh, but we will be kind of working with colleges and campuses to work out kind of all the kinks. We have previous experience with programs like this where all these little things, all these um, changes that students make all have to be kind of written out and provided in kind of a working guidance document for campuses. But I would just say, you know, let let students know that, you know, they should always check with their counselors, check with their financial aid office whenever they're making decisions about changing majors, um, because all those changes can have impacts on financial aid, not just the future together grant, but satisfactory academic progress and everything else. So, um, um, but there will be more more to see on this. So thanks for the question. All right, Nicole, I'll give you like two minutes. <laughs> thanks, Nikki. No worries, I can be fast. So, um, yeah, as Nikki mentioned, uh, the state did recently announce a goal for increasing FAFSA filing of high school seniors. And that goal is to increase FAFSA filing by five percentage points per year for the next five years with a focus on closing gaps in FAFSA filing by race and ethnicity. Um, we know that last year, fewer than 50% of our state seniors filed a FAFSA, and that's an all-time low in recent years for the state, and it also ranks Minnesota near the bottom of all states in the nation in terms of FAFSA filing. Uh, we know that filing a FAFSA is a really critical indicator of whether a student will enroll in college, and I know we at OE have concerns that the COVID-19 pandemic may be creating this lost generation of students who have not engaged in college. So the hope is that encouraging students to file the FAFSA will put college back on their radar. Um, along with this goal, um, as we mentioned, we have some dashboards available that will track our state's progress towards that goal. I did share the link in the chat. Um, and if you can also find these dashboards in the campus resource section of our website. So feel free to take a look at that. Uh, we will be updating them on a regular basis. Um, and additionally, we have some resources available on that web page uh, for counselors who may be helping students file the FAFSA. We will also be pushing out a number of other resources um, related to FAFSA filing in the form of uh, a tool, like a virtual toolkit. Uh, so please, if you have not signed up with Minnesota Goes to College, please feel free to do so, so that you can be on the list to receive any new resources as they become available. Uh, and then the last thing I'll mention is that um, if your school has not yet signed up with our state's FAFSA tracker tool and you would like to, please feel free to get in touch with me to sign up. So this tool um, allows counselors to see student level FAFSA data for their students at their school or program. And that allows counselors to identify which of their students have filed a FAFSA uh, so that they can better engage with students who have not yet filed and then also can help them uh, be sure to follow up with students who have filed a FAFSA but may have like an outstanding to do such as obtaining a parent signature. We find that it's a really useful tool and so uh, we're hoping we can get more districts signed up and we'll be updating that software uh, for the next uh, for the current FAFSA cycle hopefully next week. Thanks Nicole. Um, and so we're a minute away from being at time. Uh, we appreciate you all who are able to join us. And as a reminder, these calls are recorded, so they will be posted on the OHE public engagement website. So if you want to uh, go back and look at these, um, we are also going to share all the slides and links that were shared today. And I just want to thank you all. And again, this is just one tool in our tool belt for public engagement. And I know this was more of a presentation format, um, but we do uh, appreciate you all attending. And um, if you have any questions, you have my contact, you have Kat's, and I also put Nicole's in the um, chat uh, if you want have questions around the FAFSA completion. Um, so thank you again for joining us. We appreciate it. And we'll have another call next month in December. Um, and we'll send out information for both of those uh, coming forth. Thank you all.